Turn it over. I can't. How did I follow that up, right? Can you guys hear me okay? I'm not used to having a mic. I'm pretty loud. But uh, anyway, Steve Messing, like he said, we're for a company called the Ferber Company. And we do small retail development. And I'll get more into that in the future. I was in this program. In 1984, I was getting an MBA. So I don't think anybody was born yet. I don't know if anybody's even, David, were you born then? 1984, you were born. But not a lot of people obviously were born back then. And you know, we go back to no SEC championships. Um, there was no cell phones. We rode bikes. You know, we actually called girls for dates and met them out and picked them up and all that fun stuff. So a different era I know. But it's 33 years, and I'm gonna walk through a couple of slides. It's only about 10, so it's not that many. So I'm gonna encourage you. I know it's supposed to be talk and then ask questions, but interrupt if you want to. All right, so true to form, when I first got this you know, request, I said, well, what do you guys want me to talk about? And someone mentioned doing the, what was it again, the biological review of the um, Swiss um, consumers' activities on California real estate. And I said, no, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> so sure enough, I met with a smaller group earlier, and the first question was, what in the heck do you do? So it's interesting, because everybody wants to know, okay, we got real estate. I know I tell a lot of people even to this day and they think I put the signs and sell houses, which can be very lucrative, but it's not what I do, okay? So we're gonna get through a couple slides, but before I go through that, the next immediate question is how tall am I? So I'm six foot eight. So you got that, six eight. And uh, so, so with that, it's really, well, how in the heck did you get here? So it's been 33 years, I graduated. You know, somehow I passed Dr. Archer's classes. I don't know how, but everybody asked me, and I'm going to go through, but I was an engineering student, and everybody says, what was your defining moment? They asked that earlier. What's your defining moment? Why did you get into real estate? So i got to go back here now. So as you a answer that question, that's the reason why. <laughs> Can you believe that? Do you see that? That's you. So God knows what I look back. I was probably about 220 pounds. I'm 240 now. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm grayer too, but that was Dr. Archer around that time. We couldn't quite tell, but they had cameras back then. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an oil painting, so that's good. But if you think about it, I was a chemical engineer. I'll explain earlier. My, my dad was NASA, helped put the man on the moon, all that stuff. Original group that talked about the shuttle program, how you do that. So I was all engineering kids. So I came up here and became a chemical engineer. And I went to a... P&G recruiting talk, much like we had today, and the guy was talking about adult diapers. That's what he was designing at the time. Those are the new fad. The osmosis of adult diapers, and I'll do this, and then I'm like, is that really my future? <laughs> so, so fortunately, I had to take some finance courses. I had to take a minor, so I chose finance, because I was a five-year program. We had six semesters of thermo, so God help me. You think you have it tough? Six semesters of thermo was, was fun. But going through all that, so you know, I might want to go get an MBA. I'm not sure about this chemical engineering and working at a paper plant or a mill or going up to Wilmington, Delaware, or going out to Arizona and designing chips. And so I said, well, let me take a little more time. So they let me into the program. And Dr. Archer had some real, real estate classes back then, back, back at that look. So he didn't scare me off. And I went and took a couple courses. And I said, I kind of liked it. So as you can see here, I, I gave you a lot of data here. But if you look at the very top there, BS in chemical engineering, I did want to graduate because it was a good job. It, was, it paid as much as my MBA, after my MBA. It was a good in-demand job. Um, MBA in finance was a real estate minor. But that summer, Arthur Anderson came along and I got the intern trip to work in consulting. And they had these things called compact computers, about that big, and they were about 30 pounds. And you got to take them home if you could, and you get to work at night and get time and a half. So that was a great, great thing for, for a college kid, right? So you go through, I finished up everything, I went through the recruiting process, and my dad wanted to know why I'd waste my time on an MBA. So I told him, and you're gonna go into accounting? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Consulting, here's what I'm doing. So I showed him, and he thought that was all pretty cool. So I dreaded the call when I told him I joined Taco Bell. And that started, and we didn't even have a Taco Bell where I grew up in Merritt Island yet, I don't think. I, I think it came a few years later. but. So all of a sudden I'm explaining to my engineering dad to help put a man on the moon, and I'm gonna work for Taco Bell. And he goes, who's Taco Bell? What's, what's this about? <laughs> I said, I'm not working in the restaurant, although I spent two days in a restaurant in my life, the only restaurant experience I had as a training thing when I first joined. 
But you go through that started a, a wave of 18 years of working on the retailer side, sourcing deals and developing sites for, you can see the companies there. It was Taco Bell, and then it was Boston Market and Einstein's Bagels, and it was Eckerd Corporation. And you can see the progression there, but you know, so happened to go to Florida, chose a degree, had to get a minor, I picked finance. I found it fascinating, by the way, I don't know how you guys feel about finance, but I'm an engineer. To me, business is the banker. Finance is challenging, big, big, big uh, algorithm calculations and numbers. And again, the retail and all of a sudden, okay, this really applies to problem solving, how to get somebody to sell to you and do all this. And just, just off of a couple case studies and really looking at it. And I ended up taking the job at Taco Bell. So there, the next thing I lucked into is a division of PepsiCo. And I can tell you, PepsiCo is a great comp company. It's Frito-Lay, Pepsi-Cola, and then these restaurant chains that totaled probably 20,000 no, not 20,000, probably 10,000 back then restaurants. So with that, I got poked and prodded and trained and I was evaluated as HR. You go through training sessions, you're measured on how you develop people. You, you better have a replacement there on the bench or you're never gonna get promoted. It was really a wonderful experience. And plus, he just threw me to the walls and said, go to Boston, go start doing deals. When I get up to Boston, there's not a Taco Bell within 100 miles, right? There's no history there. They literally, people didn't know what Taco Bell was. So I carried a little pamphlet to show them, hey, it's a Mexican fast food restaurant. So we started, started doing deals there. And I was really fascinated by exploring the countryside, learning the markets, figuring out where they should go, negotiating the deal. And we did a Taco Bell A to Z. There was no brokers involved. We didn't hire outside counsel. I went to the zoning hearing. If I needed an approval, of which in Boston, I had the fun thing of needing a variance for a drive through everywhere and I needed a common victualler's license to operate a restaurant. All public hearings, different boards within the same city. So it was a great experience. The PepsiCo training was awesome. Learning about managing people, helping to read people. They sent me off to this con uh, uh, conference, uh, sent me off for this training and measured, and I did, I did well. And at the end of the day, I ended up moving out to California, which I was born there, but I moved when I was one. Dad worked at, at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Moved out to go to Port Canaveral, Cape Canaveral to you know, work on the Apollo program. So I went back to California, Western United States and Western Canada. I was, I've been to Yellowknife in the Yukon, flew four hours on a four-seater plane with my knees interlocked with the guy sitting across from me and just doing the business the whole way. Um, but fascinating and just really developed. And you see the numbers, we, you know, we did 350 new restaurants. So if you think about that, I'm roughly 34 when I left. So in my early 30s, at 350 restaurants at 150 a piece, $525 million, so half a billion dollars that we were developing. And I was responsible for it. I signed the leases. You know, so it's really a lot of really cool accountability and responsibility. We measured everything, all the analysis, and I left to go join Boston Market to seek fame and fortune. So you guys may or may not have heard about that story, but they had these stock, option, stock options that were worth a lot of money. They had a big IPO, one of the first ones. And there I ran around the country five days a week, wearing myself out, leaving on a Sunday, come back on a Friday, West Coast, East Coast, then moved to the East Coast, and that got a little bit better. And then I moved down to Florida to head up the development for the Florida group down here. Something I never thought I would do, but once again, a big company franchise group, lots of money, and we declared bankruptcy. I mean, this is the hottest concept. This is Shake Shack on steroids, right? And what happened was, it's a little bit like Enron when I look back on it, and I even said it, they had these franchise groups out there, and the company was raising funds from Wall Street, loaning funds to the franchisees who were building these restaurants, and they were paying back interest and royalties and licensing fees. So then they'd report all the income to Wall Street and get more money. And they get more debt. And all of a sudden the franchise, remember, I kind of got the call, I was down in Florida and I, I'd heard the guy in Seattle's really struggling. I'm like, oh, I started thinking about that. And I started asking around, I said, well, we're making money, we're doing okay. But they were being burdened by all this debt and all this interest. So one day I get a phone call, Steve, you know, we're not gonna make it. I'm like, what do you mean? We got to make it. We're Boston Market. So one day I walked into my office and let 14 people go, and then myself. And we still had Einstein's, was still viable, so we had a little bit of stock. But all the stock that we had moved there for was, you know, 
you know, eliminated. So that's kind of interesting because once in a really great concept, we're expanding like crazy, we're doing deals, getting good real estate. You know, you see the one here at the Oaks Mall out in front, I think it's still there, is it still there? Yeah, so, so you know, we did that deal, right? Where we wanted to, we always got the prime real estate. So, so with that, I kind of had to summer with Steve. I got a little bit of severance and had some money, but I had spent a couple months to find the next gig and I was talking to people in California, people here. But I settled on going to Echo Corporation. And that was cool because what happened there was I really started working with developers. So I ran half the country, had deal people under me, and those deal people managed developers and big companies like Assembler, Regency did about 110 of them. So a lot of big companies, a lot of people like David now and what I do now, a lot of smaller guys. So I had met Paul Ferber, who I work with now, through this program. But that was fun. That was challenging. It was competitive. We had the smaller players and not quite as much speed as Walgreens. But we had relationships. We had knowledge. We were local. And we competed with Walgreens on real estate, and we got our share. So that all built up to a more positive response was CVS and a company by the name of John Coteau wanted to buy us. And at one point, we came close and we backed away. Then we went and did the sale. So John Coteau paid $4.6 billion for Eckerd's because we had all this freestanding real estate. CVS wanted 1,500 stores, and they paid 2.1, I think it was, 2.2, about half. But CVS made a great play because they got John Coteau to buy, to buy the chain and buy the business. So all the liabilities, all the leases, the office leases of this, John Coteau had to do with, deal with that, and CVS just had the, you know, the Eckerd over on 13th Street. You know, so... It was really an, an interesting one, and, one of the, and they were asking earlier, I, I didn't tell them, but one of the more interesting things I had was the last week on the job, there was four of us left in a 1,500-person office. Three stories, I uh, got yeah, three stories. Two were on my floor, one was upstairs, and one was downstairs. And the office was empty, except for four desks, four chairs, a telephone for each desk, and a wastebasket. I'm not kidding you, there wasn't a cubicle, there wasn't a, you know, there, was, there might have been paper towels in the restroom. And we had to show up at 9 o'clock in the morning, then we left at 5 o'clock in the evening, and we take a one-hour lunch. So at noon to 1, we, we could be gone, but any other time we had to be there if that phone rang, which it didn't ring once for any of us. So it was a real estate guy, an HR guy, a legal guy, an operations guy. The president was gone, was home. So we sat through that whole week, and it was funny, being competitive, we all wanted the president's spot, even though there was only four of us. So the first morning, I don't remember if I got it, but someone got it, and we were, they were crowing, I got the president's spot, ha, 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 at lunch. Next day, someone gets their time. I think the last day, someone got there 45 minutes early just to get the president's spot to say they could. So because we were, we were bored, there was nothing to do all day. We are used to just everything coming at us the whole time. So unlike Boston Market, where all the money was lost, there was $4.6 billion taken in by J.C. Penney, and they shared some of that. And there wasn't a billion after, there wasn't a million after, but they shared, and especially at a relatively young age. So I was, what was I there, 40? Well, if no, yeah, no, I'm sorry, um, 35. 61, 95, no, 45, shoot. No, yeah, 45, yeah, it was 45. Math forgets, who cares about math anymore, right? So with that, um, you know, I went and changed courses and went on the developer side, on the dirty, you know, evil developer side because I was a retail guy and these guys were making all this money and taking advantage of us, right? So I remember I joined the, uh, the board here in 2001. So I was in pretty good contact with Dr. Archer. So I remember seeing him in one of the things. I said, I'm thinking about doing this and I might go and be a, you know, a developer. His hair immediately grayed. So that's about the same time. So that's Dr. Archer after I told him, I'm going to go be a developer. So that's hilarious, right? I mean, but he was really concerned about me. I'm his young student. Is he going to be okay with all these developers? So you can see I've been doing that now for about 13 years. And if you look at it, I joined right out of Taco Bell, the most aggressive developer, wanted to be more legitimate under control. And it's a company by the name of Unicorp. Very successful now, at least one of the partners, they actually broke up. But you can see I was there for a little bit less than a year and it, just because it didn't feel good. 
just they were too aggressive, too this, too that. They didn't do this the way I thought they should, coming from a corporate. And we made a lot of money. We did a lot of deals to their credit. But I just said, you know, guys, this really isn't a good fit for me, for my background. You guys are more wild men. Go do your thing, but this is not what I want to do. I think you might have heard that at the 21 thing, that if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. I went into it open-eyed. I knew they were a little bit of wild men. I bought the whole thing. I'm not, we want to change. And one of the lessons is really, you know, you know, leopard doesn't change a spot. And they are who they are, and they got successful. And the one partner is wildly successful now, doing really big projects. And they're savants at it. They're very smart. They know how to analyze a deal and how you can make money and how to make more money and how to grab money from somebody else and grab money from somebody else. And that's just where it kind of stopped for me. Uh, but we did a lot of deals. And you can see up there, we did a lot of Walgreens uh, work up there. I was up in New York doing that. Um, I think at the end of the, the, a little bit less than a year, we had probably 20 Walgreens that we had done, which is a lot, by the way. And you make good money on those deals. And we had a good relationship, although they were starting to wear Walgreens thin, and probably within two years, Walgreens said no more. Uh, but he didn't care. He was buying big projects and in Orlando, some of the, like the Point and all that. He's got some really nice projects he's done to his credit. So my next stop was Hunt Douglas Real Estate. So there's a couple of buddies of mine, Hamilton's on the board, and I know some of you guys know, know them. Just the opposite, very straightforward, honest, to the day is long, work hard, go get deals. So what I started knowing, noticing them was once again Walgreens, Starbucks, and then we were actually this company called Sweet Pay, which is now owned by Winn-Dixie, but it was the old cash and carry was bought by Food Lion to expand Sweet Pay, which is a concept they developed based upon Hannaford in Maine. Well, you don't see any sweet pays anymore, so thankfully we didn't develop those. We kind of dodged a bullet. If we'd been developing sweet pays, you know, I'm not sure how that would have done. And we had some in the pipeline, but I, I, I left. And part of what happened there was I was looking at the economy. We were looking, this was right before the fall. I'm not sure I was calling the fall, but I had a really good opportunity to work with a very large residential developer that had a very large project backed by the state of Washington. So I never thought I'd be on the residential side coming from the retail side, like I said, putting you know, signs in houses, but that was a really another great company and I really enjoyed them. So I switched from a very small, feed it, you catch it, you kill it, dice it all up to working for the state of Washington, interacting with them. It's a $14 billion retail component of their fund plus everything else they do. I think they're like $86 billion or something like that. But when you go through and you deal with them, it's very analytical, we'd spend forever, and you get into these bigger projects, I learned, you know, the, the performer for Babcock Ranch is 40 years. And I remember one time the analyst came to me, and I said, he goes, Steve, I think you're a little bit off, what, what, what I do on the performer and my assumptions? And he goes, you know, I think in 2032 or 2029, I think you're a little bit aggressive on your absorption of your commercial retail. I'm like, you come to me, find me on a rocking chair, and I'll throw my diaper at you if I'm wrong, okay? I'm like, really? So that was new to me, too, but it was interesting because I really got to understand re residential, which you'll hear a little bit more about that later, but I started learning how residential developers think. And, you know, on the retail side, you're getting it, you're doing it, you're churning it, and you're, you know, you're, you're buying it, but what they're doing is they're really filling a need. They're filling an order, like the P&G example. They need to have product and need to be filled it because once they create the sales machine and the motion, they need to keep going. So they need to find the next one and the next one. So it's really pretty fascinating, plus the size of the projects and planning for three recessions. I mean, the model had sales tips. You know, you'd have a nice growth and all of a sudden you'd have this growth, have that, and they did scenarios where you'd have different Amounts of those, the sensitivity analysis is also big. How much can we do and everything else? Now, fortunately, we had the right backer with the state of Washington who was patient money. And all they care about is being able to fill, you know, fill cash later on to help pay pensioners. So they were okay with a 40-year project that generated this much cash that fluctuated. Whereas my partners today or the previous partners wouldn't survive, right? So that was an interesting. So there I also had 11 centers that we, we managed during the downturn. Went from 92% occupancy down to some of the centers went down like 54, 52%. You know, chasing people, watching the failures, learning from what happened there, but also gave us on the up uptick, we were able to backfill these local tenants that just failed miserably with a lot of nationals. We had a lot of public centers. We had some good um, box retail, you know, with 
we had to deal with linen and things, but think companies like Staples and Bed Bath and & Beyond and those guys. Um, didn't have any Winn-Dixies. Uh, we were shadow anchored to a Lowe's. So we had a lot of good retail there, and I had never really managed retail, so I had a management team and a leasing team. But it's good for me to also learn how an investor looks at a shopping center. So that was fascinating. But what I also saw was they were more long-term, didn't really have an interest in doing small retail or even big retail. I mean, we did a deal with um, Walmart, the Bay Pine Steel is referenced up there, 60 some odd acres. We sold to an apartment developer. We sold to a home developer. Uh, we sold to Walmart. We built a massive 200,000 square foot store in Pinellas. This is in pa Pinellas County, by the way, Seminole, Florida, which is right by St. Pete. Uh, we sold, did the out parcel development, we released it at Texas Roadhouse, we did a Starbucks anchored center, we did a Village Inn center, and it was wildly our money. Uh, our total project, we doubled it, which is unheard of, but we bought it cheap. And so small stories, the downturn, the previous owner had gone under, taken back by a lender, and it wasn't a bank, it was a, a, a CMBS debt, and the tide, the, uh, the um, I forget the name of the group, but the oil spill in the Gulf happened. I forget, it wasn't the Valdez, but it, the oil spill in the Gulf happened. And they were worried that the entire west coast of Florida was going to be inundated with oil, and this place would be a disaster, so they dumped it, and we were there to catch it. Just small stories about how emotions and people, and if you can read the tea leaves, you can really feel what can be there. So it was wildly successful. But through that, they said, hey, go do some more Walmarts, you know, because they were surprised. We kind of stood up Walmart on a couple of things they wanted. And I went back and said, hey, guys, there's a Walmart deal in Fort Lauderdale. Let's go do that. It's been brought to me. They heard about Bay Pines, and my partners didn't want to do it. And I told them, I said, you know, here's how the math works. At closing, we'll make, honestly, $4 million. But they weren't interested. It's not, they didn't, they didn't think it was possible or it wasn't enough. No, we didn't stay the line. Community development, community development, community development. So at that stage, my expertise is retail. We're coming out of the doldrums. I had a really strong team there that could run the shopping centers. As far as Babcock, once, in, once again, 2033, I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I see something. They're build, they are building the Publix now. Um, so I decided to go ahead and make the move to somebody I'd met back in the Eckerd days, Paul Ferber and his son, Shields Ferber. So I joined the Ferber company. Uh, fourth generation family business. There is truly a, a picture of the great grandfather in a Model T outside of this office. That's like a one story, it looks like a gas station called the Ferber Company is on there. So through all the generations, they evolved into retail development. Uh, Paul was doing a lot of single tenant deals, a lot of Eckerd work. So they brought me on board to help lead the team of deal managers and project managers and get the pipeline filled and get it rolling. So that's what I do nowadays. So as you can see, I, I, I never thought, dreamed growing up as an engineer's kid, taking <coughs> physics and chemistry and calculus in high school, with everybody, by the way, the football players, everybody took that in, in, in where I grew up, and ended up on the retail side working for Taco Bell, you know, then working for a drugstore, you know, whoever would have thought that. I mean, I worked on the shuttle program, you know, I'm supposed to help put people in the space, but I found that more fascinating. And a lot of it, you know, then that evolved into being a developer. And the one difference on the developer side is not a lot of HR, <laughs> you know. So you don't have a lot of, you're up to the whims and the, and the emotions and the feelings of the individuals who are placing their money on the line and have guarantees that basically they lose stuff. It's not a, it's not a guarantee you can fold an LLC or, or something into and get away from it. It is an LLC that takes your car. You know, can't take your house, can't take your... 401ks, we can take, it's, it's, I've, during a downturn, I went through a bankruptcy and they were talking about selling the, uh, how much the piano was worth, the grand piano, 10 grand. You know, so when you really see on that side of it, it's uh, a little emotional and you really do eat what you catch. You know, on the corporate side, I got a salary, I got bonus-based performance, I got stock options. You know, so it was pretty lucrative. But here, if the deal blows up, I actually get hit because we had losses. You know, the, the money we spent chasing the deal didn't work. So it's really, a, a, if you have that competitive, if you, if you want to get there 45 minutes to get that parking spot, it's a pretty cool thing. But in the downturn, a lot of people got hurt. I knew these guys didn't because they were smart. And I know I'm keeping my head up looking for the downturn. 
And we do short term, small investment type stuff, Wawa's and all that stuff. So I've got two projects up here we can talk about, but do you have any questions kind of about my background or anything that, you know? Oh, go ahead. Oh, that's the, oh yeah, go back one. When you're, when you're transitioning out of bankruptcy, yeah. you had a couple months where you're kind of like in, in limbo there. I was interviewing. Can you, yeah, because it's a uh, $1 for price, you know, your position kind of, you've been out of UF for, you know, several years now working, um, kind of, how was that negotiation? What were you looking for? Were you willing to take anything or yeah. you kind of have a standard of, I'm not, Unless I get something, you know, yeah, that's a good question. So it was fortunate timing, I guess, in some ways. Um, you know, coming out of PepsiCo, they had an interesting thing. So on the operations side, there was 10 ZVPs that ran the operations, all the stores, uh, zoned vice presidents. They'd let like one go every year. Didn't matter. But they'd rate you for that one year. And that was it. And you were let go. That person got 10 job offers because of a PepsiCo employee. So I had that going for me, that the company was very well thought of and I had a pretty large network of people because we had a lot of people doing a lot of deals. So I felt really comfortable. I was, you know, how old was I there? Uh, so 97, so I was 36. Um, had money saved, didn't have kids at the time. Um, certainly didn't have a big mortgage. And um, what I did, it wasn't I just sat at the beach, I was living down in Florida, maybe I should have, but I interviewed. I went around and talked to people, I networked. But when the news hit me, I hadn't been doing that. And within a week, we were having the meetings to tell everybody, okay, and we didn't declare bankruptcy until after we let people go. So we give some, so I got, I got like three months severance. So that was fine. I had enough savings anyway. And what I did for the three months was I interviewed and flew around the country because I could go back to California, go up to New York, I'd worked up there. So I really looked for jobs that I thought were, were in, interesting to me. And it both boiled down to a job actually in San Francisco and the Eckerd job. And I chose the Eckerd job. Tampa's kind of not quite home for me, but lots of friends, and that's kind of home. <coughs> so that's what I did. And it wasn't so much, I just wanted something that felt good, people I knew, knew I enjoyed. Uh, the Eckerd job also had that developer role of meeting developers, whereas before I'd just buy a piece from a developer, here we managed them and got to know the, the partners and saw how. Paul and Shields acted at the Ferber Company and how Assembler and Regency and how different developers, CNL was another one, and how they all acted and, and pursued stuff and the different, different I mean CNL is totally different from Assembler is totally different from the Ferbers. So any other questions on kind of the background? So I'd never really realized until the other day that I really had a 18 year retail career, corporate career and then 13 years now in the, kind of in the devil side, in the dark side. But, uh, but anyway, it's interesting. So, um, and then it's always good to see Dr. Archer back there. I still see you that way, by the way. <laughs> so. All right, so I'm gonna go through two and ask me questions. If you guys wanna ask me questions about other projects, but I prepared two, uh, two slides. So once again, we do retail development. So in Gainesville, there's a Walgreens at 39th and 13th up the way there. And that's one of the deals we did. We didn't get the one over by um, the Publix there at Millhopper. Um, we've worked deals, and I, personally, I've done corporate deals like the CVS at Archer and 34th. It's one of the deals that I did, like my team did. So as you look at that, think that. So we're not building big $100 million projects or $50 million public centers, we're buying pieces of land and figuring out how to chop it up into small components and selling it to Chick-fil-A or whoever it is. And we're really happy if we had a two acre site just for a Wawa. So if somebody can figure out the corner of Archer and 34th for me and get me a Wawa site, I'll, I'll take it. Don't give it to David, okay? <laughs> but David's a good example. He has the Wawa and the Starbucks there um, just past uh, 75 in Archer. And he's putting a Texas Roadhouse in there and some other stuff. So. But that's kind of what I, what we do, what the team does. And the team is we have four uh, development managers in the state of Florida, and supporting them we have project managers doing the entitlements and the planning and the budgeting and the construction of it. We have a leasing team who takes the, if it's not a Wawa, you know, if there's a Wawa and a surplus piece, they figure out who to sell that to or who to lease that to. We have property management that handles the stuff that we hold and some of the legacy stuff. 
as well as that interim time frame when we finish the deal to the time we sell it. You know, who's going to make sure we collect rent and make sure if it's a multi-tenant building, who's going to maintain it, make sure the garbage cans outside are emptied and the grass is mowed. Uh, we have a C, uh, CFO who handles financing as well as accounting, so she deals with all the banks, and she's pretty vicious, so be careful out there. And then we have um, a general counsel and a couple of coordinators. We're about 25 people, right? So that's kind of the size of it. Um, and we do, you know, it ebbs and flows, unfortunately. You know, you try to get it all leveled out. It's never leveled out. So we do between 50 and $100 million in project development in a year, project cost, development budget. So here's the deal. There's a few people here. So this is down in Miami. So if you guys live down in Miami, you know uh, uh, Hylia Gardens. So the airport, I don't know, tell me if you can see all this. It's right on the East 79. That's the kind of the airport right there, Miami Airport. That's Okeechobee Boulevard, which is the main drag. Oh, I lost my button. Right there. This Walmart right here is one of the you know, top 1%, and that's from Walmart in the country. Uh, it's just incredible when you really see it. So you go up on the road that goes to that Walmart, you come to 103rd, and that's the site. So you can see there's a lot of retail on this side, there's no retail on that side, but Wawa is a 6,000 square foot convenience store with eight, eight pump fueling stations. With that, they love day population. They love having people come in to their store, buy the sandwiches, do all that stuff. They love 24 seven is what they do. They love to have all day parts. Well, you can see all the people, <laughs> you know, you can see the industrial pocket here, right in here. And by the way, this is a Palmetto, which has 200,000 cars a day. I mean, it's kind of like, you guys, who's ever driven on a Palmetto? Wow, it's a lot more than I thought. It's pretty, pretty coming down from the little old Jupiter, it's pretty, pretty fun to get on that and, and do the racetrack. Um, so we're developing that. The story here is there's a 71-year-old woman in, uh, in um, Palm Beach that owns this. It's really a you know, 50,000 square foot of industrial type space, really kind of warehouse space. They're not making anything here, but it was a glass company, a mining key repair shop, a Mako painting store, a tile shop, uh, but really an industrial metal type buildings, uh, nothing, nothing nice, nothing fancy. She owned it, she was gonna sell it, and my deal, the deal manager, Patrick Dolezal, had met her, and then she backed away and said, I wanna do it, and unfortunately she got ill. About three years later, called back. We'll so we'll get it done. We'll get to Wawa, and we got Wawa to sign up for it. Uh, once again, all the density, the population, the traffic counts. You know, it's a little bit on the wrong side of the Palmetto, but good luck getting two acres on the east side. And that's a challenge with them in Miami. Two acres just not sitting everywhere. So we did this deal, put it on the contract, went to Wawa. We went through the whole process with Wawa reviewing it, analyzing it. We had done our own performance. And what we figured out here is you can see the, it's a line of buildings, right, this line. It's not the white line of buildings, but one of the things that we really liked is, you see that? You don't have that a lot of places. Uh, a nice parking lot next to a 20,000 square foot building. So we knew we could sell that. The Wawa sits from this building north. And you got the signal here, entrances, all the approaches. So we got corporate approval, we signed the lease, and once we signed the lease, and even before that, we started the permitting process that is Dade County. And literally, Durham, Dade County, and the city of Hialeah Gardens all approved all the traffic studies, the approaches, the turn lanes, and at the very end, right where we had closed, Dade County said, no, I want something different. I'm like, wait, stop. FDOT said okay to that, and they own the road. They control the east-west road. There it is, right there. Uh, we have lead in the water. Um, we got some iron. Um, you can tell it doesn't look like a very clean site. It's not a three mile island, it's all acceptable. And so we're getting the arsenic out. So we ended up getting it approved after about eight months, which is really quick down there, but a myriad of agencies and complexities and just obviously a very dense part of the world. So we got it all approved, and uh, right now, I just got the pictures today, but we're demoing these buildings right now. We were able to simultaneously close on this one for 3.4 million. We paid 7.1 million for the bigger piece. 
and uh, it'll be we'll be finished by December, January, and Wawa will open about about June, July. They're actually going to take this one right away, David, because it's Dade County. So you can see the site plan there. That's where all the magic happens. With their this is a governance plan for their committee. So you can see the parking in the back there. They have a back door. So if you're used to Wawa, that's where I always park. You have your MPDs, your fueling stations. I'm sorry, there's only six here. They like eight. We couldn't fit eight. We got six. They concern very, very much concerned with full access here, full access there. And this is only a right in. They're okay because you get one, get people in, you can get them back. You get people in, you can get them back out. So a fun thing is right here is an AT&T control box. And we had the entrance outside the control box because we didn't want to have to relocate it. 250 grand. After the fact, Wawa said no. <laughs> Crap. So that's 250 grand out of the budget. Once again, you eat what you kill. So it's 250 grand less than what we would have made. It's a good deal. We would have done it. But when we really looked at it, we looked at, uh, fortunately, AT&T built, uh, built outside the easement area. So they have easement rights to go here, but they built over there, so they're outside their easement, so they didn't have a right to put it there. So we now have AT&T agreed to move that at their cost. Of course, we've got to wait for AT&T to get it done. They haven't started yet. It's like, come on, guys, we've got to get going here. So um, that's the deal there. We, uh, that building right there, we had to get that permitted um, to close the entrances because there's no, there's, no, there's no easement or access to the north side of this, and you have doors here. So without that, it didn't meet the fire code, so we had to get the permit to get that done. That got a little exciting because one, one of the uh, reviewers decided they want to review the entire building for code compliance, which that building is not in code compliance. So fortunately, we got them just to focus on the entrances, and we're, we're fixing that right now. Um, but deals, it's going to be a really nice deal for us. Uh, the big piece was the demand on that 20,000 square foot building was very strong. We went out at 2.8 million, sold it, I think I said 3.2, it was actually ended up being 3.4. So that's what, that's what the heck we do. You know, it's like, and everybody in the first meeting, that's the first question I was asked, well, what do you do? You know, so that's the kind of stuff we do, and we get excited about it. I saw the pictures this morning of the demolition, got me excited. I was like, wow, that's cool. Not going to die, I can picture the wall, I'm bringing a wall out of Hylia Gardens. So that's that one, so we can re replicate other stories elsewhere in every town, so. Um, any questions? So you can see over here, uh, acquisition we just closed, 820. Pad deliveries 1215, tenant open 615. Wawa and Porsche Class won the bidding process. Maybe it was 3-2 then, not 3-4. Land price was 7-3. Total pro project cost of 1098. One of the things we were able to do is do a simultaneous close. So we dropped that project cost down to 7.78 million. So that made it affordable for Wawa and a little more palatable in terms of my partners having to sign up for debt and put up the cash for this deal. So the cash, the equity on this is probably in the 1-1 one, one range, $1.1 million in cash, equity put up, and then the bank funded the rest, six, six and a half million. Personally guaranteed, take your house. No, they won't take your house, take your piano. <laughs> Any questions about that one? Yeah. Do you have an idea of what your plans are gonna be for the existing building next door? Yeah, well we sold it. Oh, we, we did sell. Yeah, so we did sell. So Imports Glass is responsible. The other fun thing that happened there, so we enclosed the doors from the inside. We had to knock everything down. We got stuck with the outside. But we went in there, we realized there's a whole lot of demo. The Imports got in there too soon and started demoing these walls and this and that. And we're like, guys, you don't have a permit. We're going to have to call for inspections, and the inspector's going to say, what's all this? So we just called for that. We went up front with the inspector. Hey, here's what happened. And Porsche came in and said, yeah, here's, we'll get the plans in here. We'll cease and desist. So the inspector's playing nice with us and said, okay, I'll go ahead and we want to get closed out there because we, we had to put money into an escrow to guarantee our completion of the work that we told them per Porsche we would do. So, yeah. So at and taken a while to move their box. Do you have a plan to sort of nudge them in the direct, right direction if they start Oh, we're not, we're, not, we're not standing outside the door with hair on fire yet. Um, we have until the end of December for our work, and then Wawa's going to take six months. So we really don't think it's going to be six months. 
I can tell you right now, if it's five months and it still hasn't happened, it's not going to be good for anybody. Because Huawei would be very upset about not opening on time and it will be our reputation. So we do think that sitting here in the end of September, it'll probably be done in January at the latest. Because they, they've signed the agreement, we recorded the easement for them, they know they have to get it done. So we remind them, when, you, when are you starting? When are you starting? But it's like a train. It just gets faster and faster as you get rolling, rolling down the hill. But there will be a point that, I mean, we'll, we'll talk. If it, say it doesn't happen by June, and while I was ready to open, there's, a, there's an attorney's letter. That you're liable for damages, you haven't complied with what you said, and, and we'll go from there. But Wawa will not be happy. Yeah. What made Wawa comfortable with having a smaller store and less frontage? Yeah, so the store's actually, that's, that's 6,100 square foot. So that's a, kind of one of their prototypes. Okay. So it looks small. But remember, a lot of the C stores, the 7 Elevens, are all there, 2,000, 2,500. So a big store is 5,000. So this is, a, this is a big, and they, I don't know if you've ever been to one. They make sandwiches and hoagies and press the iPad and do all that. They have lobster bisque, by the way. I found that fascinating. It's actually good too. Um, so the pumps, so it's all volume. So they get the volumes, they put the estimates on. This is an expensive deal. At, at the time, this is the most they paid except for a, a downtown 10,000 square foot in, inline store in DC. Uh, so as far as all the freestanding ones, this was the most that they paid. Um, but they like the density, the six parks, 24 seven business. This place has always got something going on here. It's a safe area, by the way. It's not, it's not a rough area, but there's, when I say something going on, good stuff going on, people working. Um, so uh, they just ran through all their, their parameters and said, okay, we can pay a really good number here. Because the other thing, too, is not a lot of two acre sites in Dade County. So if anybody has one, and Homestead and some of the outlying areas aren't Dade County. You know? Is there a school across the street? There is a charter school to, to pick up, yeah. So there was a little concern on the liquor sales. Off premise consumption, not on. Uh, so you can't sit outside and pop a beer. So we got through, we went to the charter school. So what do you think? Said, yeah, we're fine with it. You know, I say there's not stuff going on. There was, we had to evict one guy living in his van. And what we did, honestly, the, well, let's go to the contractor. We talked to the city, so you just tell him. So when we knew he wasn't there, we told his van. So uh, I'm not sure what happened when he came back, but that's why there's contractors and not me. <laughs> But yeah, so uh, there's a school across the way. The rest of it's all industrial. But yeah, there is a charter school across the way. Good catch. And they didn't seem to have a real issue with the alcohol sales. Some places might have an ordinance. But it's really more about on bars and on-premise consumption. And this is all off-premise. Going in and buying a six-pack and driving off is not, not, not usually an issue, even if they have that ordinance. Anything else on this one? Yep. Do you know when you were identifying the site that you wanted to put a wall wall there? Yeah. Did you identify that? Okay. Yeah, so Patrick Dollazal has been doing South Florida probably 20 years now. He's funny, he'll, he'll drive through, he'll talk about this guy, that guy. So he's met a lot of these owners over the years. He did a lot of work for CBS previously as a developer, as like a, a fee developer, which is where CBS retains you and pays you a fee. They buy the site and they pay for everything and they give you a fee, and then they own the property and the building and all this. In this case, this is a straight ground lease. Um, so with that, we get in the car with the Wawa representative, drive around, and we'll see. Patrick knew this was available, okay? And then she went away, okay? Now she's back. We're getting it in the contract with that Wawa now and said, let's go check this area out. But we knew this was a Wawa site. And were you guys approached by a broker for this site, or was Yes and no. So um, back in the day, yeah, so I think, Pat, you know, Patrick did find out. He, had, he has a network of brokers. What do you have? What do you think about? The one broker met, met, mentioned this site. He represents the 71-year-old lady who's now uh, 77. And he did know, he represented her on leasing this building. So he got the commission on selling it. And we paid him a commission for selling the import deal. So, yes. Does Wawa have any control over who you pick for the tenant next door? A lot of control. They have a series of restrictions and all that stuff. They don't care about that. But obviously they will, they will, they will restrict all your adjacent property. 
So we have a 165 acre site in Pasco County. All the retail component, all the commercial components are took against gas, fuel, electric charging, can't do a Tesla station, donut stores that primarily engage in the sale of donuts, sandwich stores that primarily engage in donuts. So you can sell a sandwich. You can be like a Chili's, you can't be a Subway and all that stuff. And the one that's really kind of annoying to us personally is the QSR, so quick service restaurants, which are your McDonald's, anybody with a drive through so Chipotle would be one. And these are legal restrictions? These are recorded restrictions against the property. They'll either be in, their, in the deed, or they'll be in the REA or ECR, or whatever the governing document governing easements and cross access and parking. So they do do that and they say, just come to me and we'll release it. So if I want to do a Chipotle, they'll give me a release for a Chipotle. But it can only be a Chipotle, it can't be something else. So Chipotle then gets, well, what do I do if I leave or I want to change? And we just say, go to Wawa. I'm like, well, what if they're not there? I'm like, well, the company was founded like in 1608 or something like that. It was an old uh, um, uh, textile company, family business. What family's been around? They built a dairy, they enjoyed their dairy farm, bought land in the country, which is 15 miles outside of Philly. And they started putting dairy cattle on there, started collecting the milk, started selling the milk, put a convenience store up to sell the milk, added gas pumps because people were coming in and yeah, and that's what they are now. And they're the, they're the best. They're the bell cow of the, uh, of the industry, pun intended. Anything else? Okay, this one's going to be a little bit different. I want to do two the same. So who's ever been to Ormond Beach, Florida? Not that. More people have been to Palmetto than Ormond Beach? Okay, well, that's good. Okay, well, Ormond Beach is just north of Daytona Beach. So the, the, the Daytona market has Port Orange and Ormond on the north and the south and the north sides, and this is one of the nicer areas. The Tomoka River runs through, it's good incomes, it's a nice area, it's right, you know, uh, five miles from the beach, the site is, from the ocean, Atlantic Ocean. So here's a site that we did in two phases, and this is going to be a multi-tenant retail development. But you can see this is your Lowe's right here, and you can kind of see what we bought for phase one was everything that looks like a bunch of trees. So maybe not uh, environmentally conscious, but we took out a lot of these trees. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a mud pit, so when they were demoing those trees and clearing it out, it was a, this much mud on that, on, that Lowe's, um, on that Lowe's entrance right here, wrapping around, the, this is a Dustin's barbecue. So the trucks would rumble out of here, go around here and come out here, and it was just caked with mud, which is a nightmare. So we know Lowe's is going to get upset, so it was a constant battle with the contract to make sure it was cleared off and clean. It smelled like swamp gas when it was cleared. I mean, this was a lot of muck. And part of what you know you have to deal with is obviously the water quality, the retention. Um, also flood, flood, flood zone replacement. So I'm going to show you the ski lake we built for phase one. So look at, so that water wasn't there. We built all of this. This is all pre treatment ponds going into what I call the ski lake. You see all the homes that used to have trees and now have a nice little lake that they sit on, right? Had to put a fountain in there, and that was all the engineering design that made this site possible. And you see all the other trees that we kept, so we're not that bad, <laughs> you know? So those homes, all of a sudden, they had a nice pond and nice trees that looked across in there, you know? And all the varmints that used to raid their backyards had to swim across now. So you had a couple of alligators, you don't have to worry about that. But uh, you can see what we did here. We developed this. I'm going to go to the zoom in. So this is what we developed as a phase one. So phase one, that is a Panera Bread with a drive through And we did a ground lease there where they basically built the improvements. We did all the parking lot for them and all that. And they came in and built their buildings called a curbs in delivery where we did everything up to the curbs and they did the sidewalks and the buildings and the dumpsters and stuff like that. So that's that. This is an Aspen Dental next to an AT&T. And the AT&T is actually a licensee that has I don't know, uh, 600 locations, great credit. Petco, which is a chain. So we got Panera's, that's Cavelli, has 110 units or so in the state of Florida. You know, so you have great credit all here, Petco. So we got a little fun, see this loading dock here? 
Uh, the engineer didn't quite get it right. It's, it fills with water. So there's always that much water in the, in the deck because it was below, it was below this stuff here, uh, the pretreatment pond. So it back into it and it wouldn't drain. So we had to put a sump pump in. Like, let me fix it. And they were complaining about it. Well, your trucks are, you know, you're backing your trucks in. You're not where you're walking in that, are you? And they're like, no, we need to fix it. So we did. And then on this side, we have a Chipotle with a Pi 5 pizza. And this little angle, you see the angle in that building? That's very unusual, but that's a mattress firm. And they actually, usually it's rectangular, you get better use of the space. No one, everybody hates any kind of angles in a retail space. They loved it because that angle would allow them to display their mattresses. As you walked in, you had a whole angled wall of mattresses. So they were actually okay with it. God help us if, you know, mattress firm just declared bankruptcy, so we're like, oh God, if they go out, what do we do? But they did, it's a good store for them. Once again, we got compelling real estate here, good quality, good incomes, we know the market, and we put stuff that we could get a Chipotle and an Aspen Dental and a Petco. So that quality, compelling real estate was really kind of important here. So that was phase one. So you can see that. So you see, uh, dear sweet Mrs. Roney owned all this, 92 years old. Well, we got her in the contract. And we got the adjacent owners. And I'll go through a little more of that. So I love Jeff Combs, the guy who did this deal that worked with us. He's just patient and Joe. So he gets her, Mrs. Roney, all that. And then he gets Mr. and Mrs. Vinyl, who are in their 70s. Then he gets Mrs. Hess's backyard. And there's a little pond right here that we kind of combine into our pond system that you'll see. So, he's got, so the youngest person right now is Mrs. Hess is 68 and has a uh, residential retail, residential brokerage company. And then uh, the vinyls are in their 70s. Then you get Dr. Salzburg, the vet that's in a dumpy little house here. He controls the curb cut and the entrance. He's getting a new store, and you'll see that. So you got, and plus 350 grand. So I mentioned that to one of my, Paul Ferber, his blood boils. Because <laughs> he got such a good deal. I'm like, well, he controls the entrance. He does. So, and then we got a little triangular piece from Seacoast Bank that was a retention. And with them, we paid them 100 grand. That right there is a retention, a little triangle. And we agreed to combine that into our pond and we'll maintain the pond. So they didn't have to maintain the bond pond and they got 100 grand that was of no value. So that's it today. Just opened, the Aldi just opened, 918. All right, they get, yeah. well, Aldi just opened. This is a nice building for sale if everybody wants to buy it. It's a Spectrum TD Bank, they're open. So Spectrum's a cable company. They're doing deals and they're, once again, phenomenal. Great. They've got the right house on that. Here is the drive through ATM for TD Bank. They agree to put it back here. And this is your Angular mattress firm from phase one with the pizza place and the, uh, and the Chipotle. By the way, the Pi 5 didn't make it. And then we were able to backfill them with Brooklyn Brothers, who's a local chain that does great, great. And whereas Pi 5 was empty, these guys are packed. And so the fun calls you get are Chipotle's now complaining because there's not enough parking because the Brooklyn Brothers is too busy. Well, it's right here, actually. So uh, it's like, I don't know what to do about it. Can't tell them not to have customers. Um, and then this is Mr. Salzburg, brand new space. And he has 14 dedicated parks. Nobody else has dedicated parks. And then this is the engineer that worked on the project. We sold him this pad for 100 grand plus 200 grand of engineering fees that he waived. We just got uh, approval for a 2,400 square foot drive-through building here, which would be a, um, a Starbucks. Um, we're going through the lengthy process of getting the Starbucks approval. We're at the LOI stage. Site plan's finally been agreed to. Once we get the LOI signed, we'll do a six pack, which is all their elevations and signage and really kind of the engineering package for them. They'll take it through a committee process that could be two months to, I mean, I, sometimes it's just incredible. But we'll negotiate a lease. We've done six or seven deals with them. We have a standard lease, so we'll just go through and hopefully get that thing signed up by, I mean, optimistically it would be January, but it might be March, you know. And then once we get the LOI and the committee approval, We'll start the plans and do the engineering and be ready to break ground once the lease is signed. 
So it's a pretty good line. I would Starbucks, Chipotle, but it gets back to what we kind of do. Other people make a lot of money by going more smaller, local, mom and pop tenants and then rotating them and getting cheaper property, cheaper rent. But well, we spend a lot of time with tenants. We know, you know, the Austin deal, we did a deal out in Austin we were talking about earlier. We didn't really have local knowledge, but we called up the Chipotle people and said, hey, give us an introduction to whoever covers uh, Austin, and now they're friends with us too. You know, Starbucks, Chick-fil-A. So we go down, and I know at Chick-fil-A, you show up at their offices, you meet in the cafeteria, and I get free ice cream. So we have an ice cream dispenser right there in the cafeteria. So. Um, you, uh, you mentioned you have some of those relationships with tenants already. Uh, yeah. Well, a lot of tenants have tenant rep brokers. Okay. So what we'll typically do is we'll know the tenant anyway, and we'll know the broker. You know, so for instance, Jorge Rodriguez for Colliers, we know him very well. He represents a lot of people. One of the people he represents is Chick-fil-A. And then we know Dar Darnell at Chick-fil-A and Mike Gomez. So we know the Chick-fil-A guys behind the scenes too. So, but no, it's not like a broker coming to say, do you ever hear of Starbucks? <laughs> no, that's, not, that's not what we, we do. And a lot of times, honestly, we'll go directly to the rep in some cases. And copy, we'll, we'll send it to the rep and copy the broker. Like here, Darnell, here's a side for you. We think it makes a lot of sense for Chick-fil-A. Or, hey, I'm copying you. This is what we do. I don't know if that's right, but that's what we do. Go ahead. Do you put any thought or stock into uh, rising sea levels when you're working on a project this close to the coast? Yeah, this thing's probably, finished floor here is probably 13, 14 feet. Um, we're inland five miles. So there's, if I was doing a downtown Miami, yeah, but yeah, so that was a long time. That's, you know, I don't know how many centuries to get that high. So yeah, so the finished floor area, most of the floor is going to be 11, 12, 13 feet, depending upon the area. But what was the cost of just building the lake? Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. I wasn't here. I'd ask Paul Ferber, but he'd give me one of those. Oh, that's so expensive. Um, you know, I'll factor it in. We did really well in phase one. So we'll talk a little bit more. So phase one, we did really, really pretty well in that. So that's phase one here. These two, these three buildings, the Panera, three tenant building, three tenant building. This piece of pond was like that. I don't know if you guys noticed that. This little dry kind of light pond and then the ski lake and uh, the trees that we didn't take out. We did really well there. On this part of it, kind of really didn't. Probably paid a little bit too much for the land. This guy here got the great deal to move back here, new building. Um, we got hit with rising costs that we forecast. And I explained earlier, we forecasted construction costs to go up like this and it kind of went like that. Um, it took us a little bit longer in the construction side of it. We got decent, we got really good credit. I mean, Spectrum's Bright House, TD Bank, and Aldi. So we got Class A, so what we're hoping and expecting is, and Aldi, by the way, is on a ground lease. So we're a little bit conservative on that exit cap, but we think that that's gonna be probably around a four and a half exit cap, we're performing five. And then these two guys were out of the 575 exit caps. I'm assuming you've covered exit caps by now. Where you take the rent, the NOI from these two, two um, building, those two tenants right there, and divide by the exit cap, and that's how you get your purchase price when you sell it. So I'm, not, I'm not sure what you guys all have gone through yet. So the Aldi is being a ground lease. It's 175 grand a year. It'll be a lower price um, because it's only 175 grand a year versus a building. And now we could trade for a better exit cap, so you get a better leverage on that, if that makes sense. So, um, so with that, we're hoping that the exit caps we have are a little bit conservative. I think we're at six and a quarter on the uh, two tenant building. So all that would probably be 700 grand if we get a four and a half and a five seven five seven five. And we're getting pretty good action on the two tenant building. And we're waiting a little bit on the Aldi. We want to sell the two tenant first, and then we'll sell the Aldi at ground lease. And the Starbucks would be a build a suit, so we build it all for them. And, you know, we're a little conservative there. But you don't know, I mean, the Feds, we're talking about the retreat, you know, the 10-year uh, Treasury has, has gone down, you know. It's down low as it's been in a long time. And it's just everybody's forecasting rising rates. So we're still in a good exit cap <coughs> environment, so hopefully it sticks for another. We'll probably deliver that 
probably I'll probably open up a Starbucks in um, in August. So hopefully we'll get that benefit at the end. But it also tells you, you don't make any money until that last bag. You do all this work and you won't make money until you, a lot of times the last tenant opens. So you're paying down the debt and the equity. Any other questions? Yeah. How soon into phase one did you begin the assembly for phase two? Well, Jeff had been working on them on phase one, so the, the development manager, Jeff Combs, he started before I joined the company six years ago on phase one. He was always pinging. Then he has a, a really a good local broker. He goes to all the events, knows everybody. And they'd always, always been working on everybody. And the issue was Mrs. Roney, the 92-year-old owner of the bigger piece. She didn't want to leave. So he was talking to the kids, and they're like, hey, mom, why don't you leave? <laughs> you know, probably started at 88, right? So finally she decided, you know, yeah, it's kind of time. You know, particularly I think the retail development next to her, kind of all the cars and stuff like that. So when she finally agreed, it took, it probably went under contract, we finished in 15. Yeah, we were probably starting to sign contracts about the time phase one was finished. But she saw phase one coming, and she was a holdout. I mean, Mrs. Mrs. Hess selling her pond in the backyard for 100 grand, she was happy as could be. You know, that's like 10 commissions for her. The vinyls, the vinyls are funny. They were 73 years old, and they really, we had to extend this because we had, you know, we had time through the uh, permitting process. We had to go back and redesign some stuff, do this, do that. And they kept getting mad because they had already put a house under contract that they wanted to move to. They were so excited about selling, right? And then she was all a flutter about it. She was all upset. And after about the third time, we said, listen, we'll just buy the house. So we went and bought the house. We said, okay, they really do have a good deal. They said, we have a good deal. And a good deal means 15 grand on their, on their you know, buying market. So we bought the house. Next thing you know, our property manager was driving by. And he said, let me go check out the house. It's being painted. And we still own it. They got to keep either fixing up the house that we own. Like, what do we do there, you know? So we had a closing issue at the very end because we have lots of moving parts. The other thing we had to do is we had debt. I forgot this. We had debt on phase one, and we had to change the property lines because of the way it really should lay out because this ATM technically is on phase one, but it's a part of phase two. And we had, uh, you know, longer-term, A10 was a lender. We had longer-term debt on the first phase, so we had to change all this, we had to deal, deal with A10 and say, hey, we need to change these lines and this and that. And so we, we got it all done, but it takes time. <laughs> we called them up, or Jeff called them up on the day that day before we were supposed to close. I, I'm loading up a moving van right now. Like, you have seven days post-closing to move. Why are you moving? Because Mrs. Mrs. Vinyl wants to move. And I'm not going to argue with her. You know, so they're actually loading up the moving van, and they were all upset. So it's going to be another week before we get close. You know, so it's just, it's back to what I was talking about problem solving and everything else is having the relationships. People get upset sometimes, it gets emotional. How to work through them and say, listen, we're really sorry about that. Here's what's going on. Bank won't loan. You have seven days. Please, please just relax until we're, we're getting this close. We're here. We're at the finish line. But please, you know, don't jump the gun. So, anything else? Yeah. Would you say a four and a half? Exit cap for your deals like Aldi, is that typical for you guys? Or? For Aldi, you know, it's funny, it's all timing. Like it was a really slow summer on the Wawa side, and then the last three <coughs> weeks it just heated up. So we had several deals, like right, we have one in Dale Mabry and Waters in Tampa. I don't know who's from Tampa, but big intersection, probably 120,000 cars combined. We couldn't sell it for four months, we just put it under contract, and the guy's he's, he's done, he's closing, put on a nice deposit. So with that, when I say four and a half, there's some trades right now at four and a half for an Aldi ground lease. Once again, the building's not backed in there. If you do that math, you know, you're, you're at a three and a half million dollar price point. That's cheap. And, you know, you, that building, that two tenant building is probably five and a half, to give you a measure. And you get an Aldi and you get a big, you know, bigger building and all that stuff. So, so four and a half is what I would say to go for, I would list it for today. And probably hold firm because not plus Aldi buys a lot of real estate they don't lease, so this would be a fairly rare deal in the marketplace. They're pretty adamant about buying, and we wouldn't we wouldn't do it here. But um, more of like a macro question: Will sure. the election next year impact or affect your disposition strategy with any of your assets? Well, I think the uh, the tax break 
that Trump put in obviously was pretty good for the developer side. That was very positive. Would the election change that and put it back to the way it was? I don't know. Nobody didn't get rid of the trade wars. You know, the, the issue with China maybe if you have a, a Democratic president. Maybe that goes away, I don't know. And then Trump's always going after the Fed. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know, I, that's a good question. I just, I put my head down, I try not to worry too much about that. And the reason is, we're doing an all-day ground lease. If it, it, we, I, I personally like a rockier market because I, I, I'm, I'm getting all day to do deals as opposed to somebody else is speculating or I, we compete all day long with people just buying real estate because they like it and how do, you, how do you compete with that? They don't have a plan for it. Well, those people go away first if there's a downturn or a rockier time. So the election next year, you know, maybe keeping the status quo is better in some ways for us, for what I do. Uh, same token, our window of time is 18 months from the time we put it. A deal that happens, it takes about 18 months to monetize. So my window is fairly short. Compared to doing a lifestyle center, it takes 10 years. Yes, Dave, I knew you were going to ask something. Turn off the recording machine. <laughs> so, a um, couple things. Uh, so, a development manager, let me describe that. That's the team leader. That's the quarterback coach, okay? So, some of those leadership skills. You're managing the project manager in our company. Now, some companies, somebody gets the real estate and they hand it off. We're not doing that. So, the deal managers that we have have a fair amount of experience and they have that leadership ability and ability to manage people. And it may not be like going through PepsiCo and poke the product, but people follow them. It's leadership, right? People follow leaders. You're not whipping people. You're not you know, behind them. They're following you. And they come to you with issues. You can help problem solve. So problem solving, leadership, um, it's not rocket science. These aren't bigger thermodynamic equations. But the problem solving skills are huge. Like Mrs. Roney won't sell. I want to go work the kids a little bit. Hey, Chris, the broker, you go talk to you know. He bumps into him, hey, why don't you get your mom to sell it? Yeah, I really want to sell. She's getting up there. He's still hanging her clothes on the clothesline in the backyard. So, so you have those side of it. There's a little bit of an analysis side to it, though. Does it make money? All right. And with that, you know, how's that work? You know, how do you analyze the deal? What's the, what, what's the, what, what are the traps down the road? So that's another piece of it. Uh, you have to be personable. You have to be able to meet. You know, we see the guys from, we see Jorge and uh, um, the guys from Chick-fil-A and they're happy to see us. They shake our hands, they come on. We've just been invited to a dinner with a tire store company out there. Hey, let's talk some more about this. Uh, we had Target come into town and say, hey, we want to meet with you at ICSC. You guys did a great job. You did a four tenant billion Port Orange. So that repeat business. And as always, you guys have heard of integrity, especially in this business. You know, it's so easy to be greedy, and it's okay for one or two deals, but 33 years later, you better make your money quick. I see some of those guys, that you, they used to be in the Bahamas, but you see some of the guys that kind of are rascals, and then now rascals living on boats in the Bahamas. Yeah, I'd rather be in it for a longer term. But that answer that question, I mean, is that? And then how much money do I make? Uh, first phase, two and a half million, second phase, about 800 depending upon cap rates. Cap rates might push it to a million too. So second phase is a disappointment. We should have been you know, closer to two million, two, 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 three. Um, so with that, in comparison to Wawa is anywhere from 500 to a million five. You might get a big hit on a deal if you have a really good <coughs> negotiation with Wawa, but they're pretty tight. Um, you know, the fast food deals or you do a single tenant Taco Bell, we did a few of those, or Three to five hundred thousand. Tire stores are five hundred thousand. We did do one that was a bigger rent, bigger store, bigger company. We made we made a million. And I explained earlier. It doesn't mean I'm getting it. Trust me. <laughs> Those guys are signing on the notes, stay up at night. Those guys are putting up the million dollars of equity. They get the lion's share of it, and we, we share in the rest. So it could be good. I had a really good year last year, and pretty light year this year. It's also an ebb and flow. 
So if you want to be able to count on that paycheck every month, then you know, that might not be for you. But if you want to be uh, like David there, you know, and that might be that might be for you. So, okay. Um, were you sure that you were going to be able to get those pre positive those houses um, before you started phase one, or no, what? no, because Mrs. Roney was not a seller. So what was your plan if you couldn't get that land? Well, we made a little bit over two million dollars, so we're just going to stay the way we were. We also knew the nice thing, we know Mrs. Roney wasn't going to sell to David because we tell David there's no way he's getting cross access to our center, <laughs> which was a light and everything else. Actually with David, we like David, so we'd probably go, David, let's just JV it, and he'd be great with that. We'd work it out. But if another developer came in without our cross access and the synergy of having the Petco, the Chipotle, Panera Bread, that's what attracted Aldi. I don't think Aldi would have gone in there if they didn't have cross access. And plus, you see the multiple access points. So you have another cut right there, and you have another cut here. And then on the other side of Dustin's, it seems like a long way, but it's helpful. You have a full light. So if you wanted to come in at the light and work your way around, you could keep doing that. You come into here. Or if you wanted to go, because there's no left out, you can do a left in, there's no left out. If you want to come out and make a left out and go out to 95, you can drive across here and come out the light, and all the light's right about there, and take a left. Or just jump out front and make a U turn. Yes? It seems like the access points are kind of the center. Um, how yep. do you work with the uh, local government to get the access that you need? Um, and did you have any issues? A lot of crying and begging and pleading. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of it's really understanding what they're really looking for, like the Hylia Gardens one I showed you. The main, dra main drags are right in. There's an existing right in, right out that's controlled by FTOT, the state. And with that, they knew we had an argument for a right in, right out to maintain the existing access. We knew they had an argument to take it from us. If they took it from us, the deal's dead. So we went through the mental anguish of saying, how about if we just do a right in? So with that, Wawa felt that you have a right in, customers can get in. You have two full cuts on the side street, 79, that you can go out and take a right and go to the light and come back. Now we're in Dade County. If you're out in rural Pasco County, maybe that doesn't apply, but in Dade County, that's, that's pretty good with all that density. So we, we agreed to do the right in only. So on this deal here, this was the only contention. This was, this was a full cut. Once again, we said, you know what? You get a left in, you get your customers in from the beaches and the housing. That, that's this way I keep doing that. And you know, really, if you look at it, take a left, take a right out. There's a full median break here that you turn. Yeah. It's not that bad. Now the neighbors back here came out. They were all up in arms about the Starbucks. And literally, we were talking about 20 uh, fast food restaurant. When you mentioned Starbucks, it kind of settled them down a little bit. But they were all like. Oh, it's gonna be horrible out here. Why'd you put an Aldi there? We don't like that. I don't know. Like, it had nothing to do with Starbucks. Well, they came out in pitchforks, but the council was a 5 0 vote because they were, it wasn't, wasn't a real argument, it was more emotion. But yeah, the, 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 the spacing criteria for the DOT, and so it's gonna be DOT, county, and city, depending on who owns the road. And they usually all will have criteria for distances to signals, curb cuts to intersections, curb cuts to curb cuts medium breaks, all that stuff. So you analyze all that and figure out where you were. So in this deal, we knew this was okay, and we knew we'd get by with no left out. Although it did chase Burger King away. Burger King was here. Uh, we knew we could live with a no left out. And then these are all per that code. You can see them kind of spaced properly. So. But that is, that is, it's a real, real issue. Yes? What does NOI look like in this project? Ooh, I put it on there. I actually have that answer. There you go. Phase one. Oh, phase one's back. So phase two is 350 grand a year. Remember, we have a big ground lease, so it's going to be lower because we didn't build that building, so we didn't have to uh, get our cost back in terms of rent. So that that's a 21,000 square foot building of the total of 30,000 square feet of retail. So keep that in mind. Plus these two back here, we we sold. Actually, we sold that one. This one we really swapped for the land up front. Plus a three hundred fifty thousand dollar payment. Uh, the project costs the land. Yeah. 
that one here? So here, the rent was seven, net NOI was 715000 They're all triple net leases. We do maintain the property. We're responsible for the buildings except for, except for Aldi and for Panera. They built the building as they own it. Um, but we get a complete reimbursement of that from everybody. So taxes, insurance, and common area maintenance. There's no what's called leakage where you actually, you know, you spend a dollar, you only get 96 cents back. We don't have that in these leases. They're all true triple net. Okay. Which is an important thing, by the way. Yes. Uh, Did you say you had longer term debt on phase one than phase two? Yeah, so phase one, we wanted to hold it. Partner <coughs> decided. So the deal started before me, so I wasn't really involved until it came time to do it next to help. So, uh, so I helped. We helped get the deal done and get it open. But they wanted to hold it, so they put in, um, I think it was a 10 year term, 30 year, 25 or 30 year AMP on it. And um, so they did that with a company by the name of A10 Capital, gave the best rates, best term. Um, so yeah, so we put long term on that. We're still on the construction loan on this, which this is probably given the nature of probably a 24 month construction loan. With the sponsorship, which is Paul and Shields, and their history of never giving anything back, and how they, in their balance sheets, they're really what's called great sponsors. If we need to go to 36 months, no problem. And we went back to A10, and was very happy with the first deal, and they cooperated with us once again, reputation. They're not always easy to deal with, but we're fair, and we'll say no, but you know, they got that deal done, so we went to them, hey, we wanna go ahead and change, since they did that, I don't think they even charged us a fee. So, they just did as part of the, and so if we go long term, they may get that or they may not. Now we're going to sell it. So. Oh, the other thing we did here too, phase one's all one development, one piece of property. Oh, that was it. If you look at phase two, we actually did a condominium. So this is a condominium property, it's all the parking area. This is one unit, two units, three units, and these two, two tenants are four units. So the condominium kind of governs all these condominium common areas. And that way we can sell this separately from selling this. And we can sell these two. Because the issue if we had parceled it out, then we have to give this guy enough parking so he owns this piece, they own that piece, this guy owns this piece, you know, it's kind of a mess. And then the out parcel we kept separate. So the out parcel has a cross access easement with the condominium, because then you're selling a parcel of land, a point, I think it's point 0.8 acres. That's another little nuance there. So lots of legal bills in this one. Yes? So you guys are building it at an 11 cap and selling it at a six and a quarter, the cost? Um, 11 cap? I don't think it's that high, is it? It was, uh, I did like the 7.6 million? Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, that's why we made so much money on the first phase. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Let's, let's keep doing that. Find me more. Let's go. So once again, that was, that, so this is the second one. So you can see here it's a little different. You know, so let's talk about how we really look at things. Listen, we're short-term merchant builders. That means we sell stuff. If we want to hold it, like they decide to hold the first phase, that's decided after it's, maybe you have an idea. We really don't plan on that until we break ground. Our CFO goes out and gets long-term debt and sees what it looks like with the cash flow, what can we do there? And here they said yes, because it was actually a 1031 from another property up in New Jersey. What we really look at is really a multiple. We're really simple. Nobody in the finance group would ever approve what we do. We don't do IRRs, we're not long-term, we don't look at 10-year cash flows, we don't do any of that. Like I said, my previous life at Kitson, <laughs> in 30-year cash flows, I mean, you know, like that. So we just keep rolling the paper, you know? So here, all we do is say, okay, if you're gonna invest a dollar of equity, our ideal world is gonna make two back. Okay, so you invest a dollar, and you get $2 of profit. Profit divided by equity. Okay, so that's our goal. And when you get into deals where you're building buildings, that probably goes down to a one. It's really hard to do that when you're building buildings and investing that much equity, all that. So if, you can, if, if our partners can go in there and get two times their money in profit, we're all set and we'll adjust that up and down. So phase one was over two because I guess the, the return was so good. So uh, yay for them, it wasn't me. 
But the second phase, you know, we're like a 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So it's just it's disappointing, but that happens. But once again, we have quality real estate and quality tenants. We still have some hope for the cap rate side of it, but still we're not we're not losing. It's hard to lose money at what we do with, with these quality tenants. It's hard to lose money on Walla. Not impossible, but it's hard. It's hard. You always make some money, which you can't save for a lot of retail, building shopping center and all that. A lot of shopping centers. Are, let's just say this in the downturn. A lot of shopping centers were given back. I don't think there was one freestanding Walgreens that was ever given back. You know, in the downturn, and that was pretty. That was that was that was Dorian esque. Just like that hurricane was. It's once in a, hopefully once in a lifetime. Okay, what else you got? That's it? Okay. Do I get, did I get a, at least a C? Did I pass? Can I go to the next class next semester? Yes. What do you think? Okay. I don't good. know if Dr. Rich will say. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, he's, he's hard to pass.